groups. This is political action groups. This is this is this is again our religion. So you've got the false cover of religion. Uh, you've got a lot of dollars, tremendous amount of oil dollars, as you know, are fueling this terrorism and fueling this movement. So you've got a lot of money behind this, and you have got this political correctness where we're kind of stepping on eggshells a little bit. You know, we're 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 tiptoeing around this issue because we don't want to insult anybody. And so that cocktail of political correctness, of a lot of money driving this, of strong messaging driving this, and the cover of religion is enough to bring this over here in full force and in Europe. Mm, absolutely. And of course, we're seeing that. We saw that here with the last Democratic debate. They were so afraid to say those words, radical Islam. Why do you think there is such an issue here with uttering those words? I think that there's a real lack of understanding of what the difference between a radical Islam and Islam is. And there's such a sensitivity about this, which is surprising and shocking because the amount of information that we have, the proof that we have that the Muslim Brotherhood is a network that operates in this country and other countries, just like it operates in Saudi Arabia and the Emirates and elsewhere, which is the brains and the strategy and the funding mechanism for radical Islam, and yet no one will say Muslim Brotherhood in this country, no one will say radical Islam. Um, if I can take a minute and I can say this, our coalition country leaders, Saudi Arabia and the Emirates, when ISIS popped up its head in 2014, the first thing that those countries did was ban the Muslim Brotherhood because they understand that the Muslim Brotherhood is kind of the computer brain behind everything. Very difficult move for Saudi Arabia and for the Emirates to ban the Muslim Brotherhood. Of course, we know Egypt did it as well. Mm -hmm. However, in this country, we're not willing to do that. So if we're part of a coalition and we see our coalition allies taking certain tactics, shouldn't we be looking at this and saying, why have you banned the Muslim Brotherhood? What is the relationship between that and ISIS? And we should be taking their lead, which we are not. Absolutely. Well, now, Joy, I want you to just hang on just a moment. We're going to take a quick break. When we get back, I want you to break it down. What can we possibly do to halt this here in our country? What can, what can we do to protect ourselves? So we'll be right back. You guys have the exclusive for, which is a product called Deep Cleanse. And why I'm so excited about it is it's a unique formula, almost like the iodine crystals. We have two unique products that nobody in the world has. One of the most amazing ingredients in the world and it's called shilajit and it's actually known as blood of the mountain or rock sweat because thousands of years ago as a matter of fact this ingredient was only given to the elite of the elite thousands of years ago up in the himalayan mountains and in tibet and we wanted to put this in, in stuff for, for a couple years but we couldn't get an organic form right i mean so I, let's explain i mean this stuff's so good we couldn't put it out for years right so i had to actually it's kind of like the iodine crystals finding a source deep in the earth that we could get the cleanest source available but in tibet and in nepal and in the himalayan mountains thousands of years ago they found they watched these monkeys and during the summer months the monkeys would go up into the mountains now you're being racist against monkeys and they would pick this black substance from the mountains and so uh, in Russia, they actually, it, it grows in Russia in the mountains and in the Himalayas and only in the summer. And Chilajit is actually the decomposition of seven, up to 7,000 different medicinal herbs. So it decomposes, all these different herbs decompose in the Himalayan mountains and the volcanic soil up there. And what happens in the summertime- So it's almost like an oil up, from- Yes, it's high in fulvic acid, it's high in humic acid. Because they're, they're always claiming down. oil is really from decomposed animals and plants. There is some oil that is based from fossils, but most of it's really abiotic. But So, so this is a true fossil uh, source? I mean, explain it to me. It is, uh, it's really the decomposition, like I said, of over 7,000 different medicinal herbs and plants. And, it, and with the rocks and the pressure deep in the mountains, it freezes and... And during the summertime and the pressures build it up, it oozes out. It oozes out. So it literally oozes out of the mountain. It's like rock sap. It's like rock sap. It's black and it's highly nutritious. Uh, even in the 1980s, when the Olympic athletes in Russia were accused of being on steroids, they found out that they were actually been given shalajit because it, it works as an anabolic as well. 
and it builds muscles. It's a big dose in there. The second big main ingredient in there is a volcanic zeolite concentrate. And this, what this formula is designed to do, the shilajit and the zeolites have a real strong negative charge. All the metals and chemicals and PCBs and VOCs have positive charges. So these go in, they grab it, and then they safely eliminate it through the body so you can become healthy. I mean, the, this is an amazing formula. I wish I actually had it, but because this was an exclusive InfoWars Life product, you're the only one in the world that has this formula now. And, uh, you know, there is going to be a limited supply available when you sell out because you can only harvest this once a year. How do people take it? How is it recommended that this be done? Just a daily, daily dose? Yeah, daily dose. Uh, the instructions are on the label. You know, of course, I, I kind of modify it for each individual. It depends on what your lifestyle is. I mean, the, honestly, the best thing to do is for you to avoid all these chemicals and toxins in your environment and try to identify them and start slowly reducing them. But personally, I, I'm going to probably take it every day, every other day, and I'll probably go with about a dropper full to maybe two dropper fulls. Uh, and I and I, li I don't expose myself to any chemicals. Infowarslife.com. Please also support our local AM and FM affiliates, support their local sponsors, or become a sponsor and spread the word. Because these aren't just great products. This is how we fund this independent operation. We're not taxpayer funded like MSNBC or NPR, and neither is your local station. So support them, folks. This is a war. <laughs> Welcome back. I'm speaking with Joy Brighton. She is the author of Shariaism is Here, The Battle to Control Women and Everyone Else. Now, right before we went to break, you were speaking about the Muslim Brotherhood and how the first thing Saudi Arabia did was, you know, kick the Muslim Brotherhood out of their country. Why have we not done that here? Why are we so afraid to even utter those words? What do you think about other organizations that are here, uh, such as CARE, that purport to represent American Muslims? Well, you know, it's interesting. As I said, the Emirates also banned the Muslim Brotherhood, and they went so far as to actually list 82 Muslim Brotherhood front groups. Two of them were the largest Muslim civil liberties groups in America. One was CARE, Council of American Islamic Relations, and one was uh, Muslim American Society, MAS, were on the list. The Obama administration said, wait a minute, Emirates, you've made a mistake. These are not terror groups. These are just political action groups in the United States. And the Emirates said, oh no, you've got it wrong. This is Muslim Brotherhood. Wow. And so now we have reports where there are actual Muslims, um, a lot of women as well, that are fighting back against honor killings and some of these more extreme views that you will have with Islam. And these Muslims are being called out by the regressive left um, saying that that's hate speech. So they're not even allowed to speak about their own religion or things that are going on within their own community. Yeah, well, this is, you know, Shariaism, movement of political control, okay, is like communism and Nazism. What is the most important element to control someone is to shut down political debate. You want to shut down debate. So if you, if you say, well, what you're saying is hate speech and I'm going to criminalize that, that shuts the debate down. So what you're speaking about is, um, there's women who are who are who are trying to talk about honor killings in this country. Ayan Hirsi Ali is one of them. Went to Brandeis, was supposed to be keynote speaker at the very end, and she is a women rights activist and has been. Um, Brandeis University said, "Well, you're very critical of Islam, and we think this is hate speech. Therefore, we don't want you on campus." So this is censorship. This is control of information. This is control of free speech. And again, once you start controlling the information that people have, the only information that then we then hear about is coming from a side that basically has a point of view. And so shutting down free speech and free political debate is very, very dangerous and very powerful. Right. And this is something that's going on here in America. It's going on in the UK. We have actually uh, these Sharia courts that are working in tandem. Uh, women are going to these courts rather than um, the justice system that's set up in our country. And much to their detriment, they're getting advice from, from men in most instances that are going to probably take their husband's side and, you know, go with the more um, thousands year old rules with their religion. So why do you think that is? Why do you think young women involved here are so, I don't know, willing to submit? Well, I remember, you know, these women, women who ha are women who end up going to Sharia court are women by definition who are, in a, who are involved in a fundamental household. 
and they are very much trapped and their only outlet is to go. They can't if they go to an outside U.S. court. OK, they will be. Uh, you know, they, they will be uh, threatened, if not actually killed. We've actually have honor killings in this country as well. So they're going to go. The only place that they know is the Sharia courts. And the problem in this country is that we're saying that Sharia courts are OK. We've got to show young women that there is an alternative. And if this generation doesn't have the strength to go outside and go into the U.S. courts, maybe their daughters will. But if this generation of young women who are still going to the Sharia courts feels like they're not going to be protected anymore in a U.S. court of law um, mm -hmm. because people are going to say that this is just their religion and it's a domestic violence issue, then then they're always going to get, then they're going to teach their daughters to go to Sharia courts also. So we really need to be the safety net. If these women are not using Sharia, not using U.S. courts now, we have to show them that should they choose to go to U.S. courts in the future, we will protect them. And we will not say that this is religious freedom. But we will actually say that this is this is oppression of women and it's against our Constitution. It's against equal rights. Absolutely. And now what do you think about Donald Trump's calls? Um, he was saying, let's put a temporary ban on bringing Muslims in the country until we can fix our vetting system. Well, I don't agree with that. However, uh, I can offer up solutions to what I think is a better tactic. And what I'm very frustrated with is that everyone is so quick to jump on Trump and say, this is unconstitutional, left, right, and center. But what they're not saying, we're not hearing from any presidential candidate, well, what would you propose? And I think it's very important. Let's not shoot the messenger here. We have a problem in this country. We've been unwilling to deal with it. And OK, fine. You don't want to ban on Muslims, nor do I. Here's what I would propose. Are you ready? <laughs> Give it to me. <laughs> so what I would propose is, first of all, deporting the entire extended family of a, of, a, of a terrorist, because these terrorists do not care about life or death. And as I mentioned before, generally, their families are not involved in terrorism. And I can tell you that many of their extended families are not involved. However, they probably know that this particular family member has becoming radicalized. They are seeing that. And so they have a first view into saying something is happening and they can police their own family members. If there's something at stake, if there is a risk that they themselves will be deported unless they, unless they take that family member and put him back on the right track, um, then, then this is going to continue to be happening. And uh, this is a very humane way of doing it. Uh, it's, gonna, it's a very effective way of doing it. We know Israel... Uh, is is revoking citizenship at this at this point also. Mm -hmm. And so that's one thing that you say that we could do to protect this country, protect ourselves. Um, any other suggestions? No. Well, the other suggestion is that we need to be as as Egypt, as Saudi Arabia, as the Emirates have done. We need to be looking into organizations that are, according to the Emirates themselves, or Muslim Brotherhood front groups, because these groups are the funding and and the strategic network of of ISIS. We need to be doing that. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's hard to say this, but the fact of the matter is that we have a network in our mosques. OK, there is a network of mosques that are radical mosques. Unfortunately, some of these mosques are not houses of prayer. They are Sharia, what I say, Sharia command and control centers. And we've got to face the facts on this. The Boston Marathon. Why did it happen there? Because there is a radicalization hub within the mosque system there. We're seeing radical mosques throughout this country, and we're going to have to, as France has been doing, is going in, surveilling mosques, and actually deporting some of these imams that are very fundamental. Mm -hmm. Well, just about, we've got about two minutes left, so what do you want to say out there to Americans? Because obviously, we have seen some hate crimes happening. People are going and spray painting mosques or throwing coffee on uh, women who are wearing the headscarves and things. I mean, that's not right, obviously. So what no. do you want to say to Americans out there, as well as uh, Muslim Americans, um, to just be wary, but also to kind of curtail this political correctness run amok? Well, listen, the more we talk about this openly, the less there is this tension, OK, to just throw coffee at someone, which is a horrible thing. We've got to talk about it like civilized people. We have to have a heated political debate. 
And heated political debates are very, very ugly. And there's a lot of mudslinging and people call people bad names. But I'd rather be called a bad name than have coffee thrown in my face, right? Or start shooting each other.